started out so high but we got so low all right, let's talk about dogs and their nutritional considerations. Unlike cats, dogs actually do really well and are naturally predisposed to wanting to meal feed. The nutritional intake for dogs works best when meal fed with portion control and time restriction. Cats, we talked about, it's natural for them to graze and just pick away at their food. So, of course, what are the risks and benefits of free feeding versus meal feeding? We'll get into that. So here's a handy chart, free fed versus meal fed, with the risks and benefits. Free fed, benefit, easy for owner, best suited for cats. The risks, of course, are obesity. So a lot of animals can't regulate their appetite, or at least they can't stop eating once they're actually full. There's a sanitary aspect of food, and that's in regard to cleaning the bowls, ensuring that the food and the water is changed regularly. Sometimes you're unable to detect small changes in appetite. Time and time again, and I'm guilty of this with the cats too, but time and again I get clients who are trying to find out if the dog has stopped eating, if so, for how long. And if it's a dog that's just free fed and the food sits there all the time, most people have no idea if their dog has stopped eating. So it might be a couple days before the owner is able to notice that the food isn't decreasing in the bowl. Puppies and overweight animals, of course, <clears throat> can gorge themselves. And then when we look at meal feeding, the benefits are able to detect minor changes to appetite, plus or minus catch diseases uh, sorry, disease processes a little bit faster. So again, just noticing that I feed Fluffy every day at five o'clock. She always scarfs it down, and today she left half her food. That's a big deal for some animals. You're able to more accurately monitor caloric intake and reduce obesity, or at least reduce the chances that your animal will become obese because you're very much controlling the amount of food that goes into their mouth. And if you're meal feeding, the food's not going to sit there and spoil. So you're not leaving wet food out all day. You're not leaving, you know, chunks of <laughs> raw diet out all day, but you're meal feeding. The risks, it's a little bit more time consuming for owners because we have to measure your dog or cat, but your dog also tends to get really, really in tune with their feeding schedule. So they'll start bothering you at dinner time and breakfast time. May be difficult with shift work or life schedules for certain people in their lifestyles. So overall, we talk about we've already talked about what cats need. So in regard to dogs, they need an increased amount of carbohydrates compared to cats and less fat and protein than cats. You need to monitor dogs very closely. Cats, slow changes are great, slow changes are welcomed with cats. Dogs can lose a little bit of weight a little bit faster than cats without having their organs shut down or come into challenges. But we want to watch them and monitor them very closely on diets to ensure that they're not going to gain weight too fast. Or in general, they're not going to change in body condition score to an area that's obese or fat or, or, or sorry, obese or overweight. So body condition score and weight should be considered as well as exercise routine and activity levels. And then what about those extremely active dogs that we have? So those dogs who do agility, those working dogs, dogs that are sled dogs, what do we have to be concerned about with them? Well, these kind of dogs, active dogs and working dogs, they need to meet higher energy requirements. We often look for a high quality fat source because dogs do require less fat. The fat that we put into their body, we want it to be a higher quality fat. And fat is the most energy dense nutrient. So if we keep this in mind, carbs have four calories per gram, protein three and a half calories per gram, fats have nine calories per gram. So sometimes these dogs that are more active do require a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat, than their less active couch potato compadres. Fat is more rapidly digestible than carbs and proteins. So again, keeping that in mind if we're increasing their level of nutrients in their diet because of activity. So why else do dogs technically and cats, why, why do all of us need fats in their diet? We can't live 
an exclusive fat-free life. It's impossible. So we need fats not only for insulation and thermal regulation. We use it as protection for our organs, of course. We have a natural level of fat in the body. We use it for the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Those fat-soluble vitamins are stored in the liver and they're stored in the fat. That's really important. So we need to maintain certain levels of fat in the body in order to access those vitamins and have them store appropriately. Also, fat is beneficial for brain function and neural synapses. So if we think about DHA and EPA, those brain omegas that are really important, it's, uh, that's exactly why that they tell you to take salmon oil and fish oil. And of course, northern dogs, dogs who live, to any dog that lives outdoors, in, I mean, typically in Canada, it gets cold in the winter, but dogs who live outdoors, whether they're full on northern or just in central Ontario, they definitely need an increased level of fat in their diets. They need it for energy and also to develop their insulating fat layers around their organs and underneath their skin. So this mama dog lives way up in Pond Inlet, Nunavut. If she's still around, I highly doubt it because this was a long time ago. But you could see here, she's an outdoor dog. She lives on the tundra. She also is a lactating dog. She's got puppies underneath her in her den. So this dog would need a high fat content in her food in order to maintain insulation, maintain her own fat levels, while also providing fat through milk for her puppies. Common ailments with dogs, of course, obesity is number one. So we'll talk about obesity, we'll talk about joint problems and dental issues. This is, as always with dogs and cats, it's a common preventable ailment. Okay, really, really important. Obesity is number one, of course, on my list. I think it's just because I'm jaded and there's so many chubby animals out there. But obesity, <clears throat> bone and joint diseases and dental diseases, we'll chat about it. About So preventive adult diets, meal-fed, time-restricted, and calorie-restricted are all ideal preventive tools for obesity. Lay off the treats is really important. We talked about this with cats. What I recommend for owners who are trying to get their dog to lose weight is measure out their food for the day. So we have a caloric intake that they need for the day. The RVT or the veterinarian has come up with this resting energy requirement. Put that food aside for the day and you can use that food for meals, but also you can use that food as treats. So then all of their calories are accounted for in both the meals and their treats. Increase the insoluble fiber, so that's that, or sorry, the insoluble carbohydrates, that's fiber, and those are the substances that, of course, dilute the caloric density of food and help the animal feel fuller longer. Exercise is super important. Even if it's just taking your dog for a 10-minute walk twice a day, it's really important to stimulate your dog, have them using their joints, having you know their blood flow, and of course, burning a bit of calories and maintaining muscle as well. So can you use regular dog food and just count or cut down the amount that you're giving your dog? Why can't you do that? So the, the answer to that is no, that's not ideal. We want to find out the total resting energy requirement for that dog based on their lifestyle factors and their age factors. And then within that, the, I mean, the client, of course, might have to cut down the amount of food if they're overfeeding. But as long as we've identified the ideal caloric intake for that dog, we shouldn't be using regular food and just cutting it back. Because not only are you cutting back the calories in your, in your diet, but you're actually cutting back all of those nutrients that are contained in that food. So instead of just cutting down like crazy on regular food and potentially actually sending the dog into starvation mode, which isn't ideal because the body's just starving for those nutrients that they're now being cut out of the diet. Instead of that, we should choose a really high quality, uh, typically a veterinary brand or otherwise of weight loss or weight maintenance food. So then those diets are clinically formulated and clinically trialed to ensure that 
the caloric density is lowered, so the animal still gets a large amount of food to eat with less calories, and all the nutrients are still spread through the food. So their total daily intake of nutrients hasn't been shifted to a point that's unbalanced. They're just getting it diluted so that they're able to eat more and, of course, acquire less calories. Obesity is much easier to prevent than to treat. So please don't ever um, underestimate the value of that and also the value of talking to clients about that because it's really hard. It's an active effort to get an animal to lose weight appropriately and not too fast. All right, jo joints and bones. I always, I, I always say joints and bones. I don't know. <laughs> so who's at higher risk of joint disease in the dog world? Well, of course, most often we start to look at our large or giant breed dogs. They are definitely at higher risk, just the way that their physical anatomy is structured, and likewise the way their bones develop. So we'll talk about this when we talk about life stage feeding as well, but we have to be very careful about the ratios of calcium and phosphorus in dogs' diets when they're quite young, especially large breed dogs. Omega-3 and omega-6 are really helpful with animals who have uh, joint or bone disease or conditions. So omega-3, we want to have a 25 to 1 omega-6 ratio, so very, very little omega-6. But when we get that ideal ratio, it provides an anti-inflammatory property to the, to the diet. Glucosamine and chondroitin in various forms are also typically added to these joint diets. Typical joint diets include Royal Canin Mobility Support, and I believe they've changed that formulation recently, and Hills JD. All of those are excellent foods. They tend to renew them every few years because they often find new valuable formulations, including new sources of chondroitin or glucosamine or essential fatty acids and omegas. So looking at the joints, there are lots of different problems that can happen with the joints. What we often see is arthritis, where that cartilage layer starts to wear down between the two bones. So between the uh, femur, the distal aspect of the femur, and the head of the tibia, they're both covered in beautiful uh, hyaline cartilage. And then over time, of course, that wears down with arthritis, and it becomes bone on bone. So they start to lose that protective surface. The ingredients in a joint and bone diet can really help prevent that progression of disease and prevent sort of that wear down of cartilage and inflammation that that lack of cartilage is causing. Another popular topic and disease that can be in part prevented with diet is dental disease. Dental specific diets, they work in two key ways. There is enzymatic removal of plaque. So the kibble actually contain enzymes when the animal eats the food. Enzymes float around in their mouth and they break down the accumulation of plaque on the teeth. And there's also a mechanical action to remove the plaque. And we talked about this earlier. So when cats and dogs bite into a dental diet, the kibbles are about one and a half to at least two times the size of a normal dog or cat kibble. And what happens, they're forcing the tooth to actually break into the middle of the kibble and that crunch is allowing the kibble pretty much to brush their teeth for them. Which works really well if you have a cat or a dog who actually chews their food. I have a cat who doesn't chew her food and I have a dog who I think she just breathes in and takes in all her food because she doesn't chew at all. I don't think I've ever actually heard my dog chew, which is really weird. So this will not remove tartar and calculus. So plaque, talking about a bit of terminology, is the film of bacteria that builds up every few hours on the teeth. If it's not removed, then it hardens and it turns into this firm deposit called tartar. In the later stages of tartar, we get mineralization and that becomes calculus. And it's that really big, thick, really hard deposits on the teeth. So no amount of brushing is going to get rid of calculus that has to be removed with dental instruments. So same with these diets. If they have big chunks of tartar and calculus, the diets won't be able to touch that much. So really this is a preventive diet for dental disease. 
a great, great, great opportunity for clients to be engaged with their animal is to brush their teeth and to learn to brush their teeth and get their dog gently used to toothbrushing. Same with their cat. You can always recommend, or this is what I recommend that I like, if they can't manipulate a toothbrush in the animal's mouth, they can always put a really thin face cloth or a piece of gauze over their finger and just gently scrub each of the animal's teeth on the out the sort of the buccal side and the labial side of the teeth. That way at least they're removing that accumulation of plaque as it carries on. And of course, caution if dental disease is already present. I've met a lot of people who are brushing their dog's teeth religiously, but the dog has really severe dental disease. And in fact, all they're doing is disrupting the, the mouth itself. So they end up they end up causing a lot of pain. Because if the teeth are just hanging on by a thread, such as in this photo here, and you're brushing those teeth, look at that root exposure. That's a ton of root exposure. So that's stage four advanced periodontal disease. There's a ton of root exposure. There's pus in the teeth. Same with stage three, a lot of root exposure there. So we want to get the dental diet going when they have stage one gingivitis and maybe early periodontal disease. But realistically, stage one gingivitis, that's even before that, is when we want to use the dental disease to help prevent this from happening. And it's so common. It's gross. Okay, so that's it for those diets. Those are the really common preventive disease diets for dogs. So for cats, definitely talked about obesity. We talked about uh, feline lower urinary tract disease. And for dogs, we talked about obesity joint and bone disease, and dental. So now we're going to move on to life stages and talk about a brief over overview of the nutritional requirements as the years progress in dogs and cats. So this is geared both to dogs and cats. So a little bit of lingo to start with. This is a handy chart, and I believe this one, this is for dogs specifically. So this is essentially a calorie chart. So it tells you by weight how many calories the animal needs as part of their resting energy requirement. Resting energy requirement then gets a life stage factor added to it, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the resting energy requirement is the baseline daily caloric requirement. The DER is the resting energy requirement multiplied by the life stage factor. So the typical RER is 70 multiplied by the kilograms to the factor of 0.75, and that's their baseline for the average number of calories per day that animal needs, and that's dog or cat. So then we have these life stage factors that are multiplied by the RER. So we have, as animals get older, as they get less active, as they are neutered or spayed, then it starts to affect their life stage factor. You'll notice that we have a puppy, zero to four months, or an active working dog is 2.0, all the way up to five times the resting energy requirement, which is a pretty substantial increase in calories. But this is beneficial for a lot of pet owners to go through and work through to get their total caloric intake appropriately designated for their dog. However, these are all approximations of your pet's caloric needs. Okay, There are specific adjustments that need to be made for breeds, for energy level. If you have a small dog that's active, like a poodle and a Jack Russell, they might seem like the same energy requirement at first, but a Jack Russell actually is a lot more active, a lot more muscular, and they're using up a lot more energy than, say, a toy poodle. So things to consider. It's just like with people. Not everybody metabolizes the same. Same with animals. And a lot of animals will need different calorie requirements uh, depending on their, their overall life stage, but also specifics to their genetics. Looking at puppies and kittens, for the first six months, there's a ton of growth. There's rapid, rapid growth. It's For the first year, it's almost, I think it's like 70% or 700 times growth. It's unbelievable. So neonates, the really little guy, we want to watch for equal growth and development in their joints and in their body. 
How do we end up with a runt in a litter? Well, it's we always want to be watching the puppies and the kittens as they're developing with mum to ensure that they're gaining weight at the same rate in the litter. If they're not, we end up with a runt, so we end up with one that's smaller than the other. Big, bigger siblings might be pushing them out of the way for the nipple, for milk. So it's kind of tricky. If you are breeding or if you have puppies and kittens at home, that's something that you need to be checking all the time. So yes, runts of the litter are cute. However, we want that little tiny little animal to be able to grow and prosper the way its uh, siblings do. So if that's the case, sometimes that little runt needs a little bit extra time on the mum alone without its siblings. And you also want to make sure that the mum is actually accepting the runt as well. Because sometimes they'll sort of push one aside if it starts to show that it's weaker or smaller than the others. If you have a runt and the mom is not actively feeding it or the milk flow isn't there, we might need supplementation with puppy or kitten formula or else we get a small animal who has growth and development challenges throughout. Question that always comes up, can we just give cow's milk? Not really. So cow's milk can actually cause a little bit more harm than good. It is pasteurized and the dog or cat, they're not getting the exactly what they need in the way of nutrients from cow's milk. So their guts are so young and so new that they're not ready for such a drastic shift in milk protein. So really they should get specifically formulated puppy or kitten formula or the mum's milk specifically. It can, if we just give cow's milk, it can cause drastic changes. They can get diarrhea and they won't be getting that natural flora that they need and the natural antibodies that they need from their mum. Weaning times, kittens, we wean them, so we start to reduce their amount of milk intake from the mum and start slowly increasing their level of puppy food or kitten food. So kittens, that starts around seven weeks. Large breed dogs, three to four weeks. Small breed dogs, five to six weeks. And then sometimes it just depends on the puppy or kitten too. You might want to keep them on the mum a little bit longer if they're looking a little underweight or if they're not as active or if they don't quite have as much muscling as they should. Once we start weaning, we're going to offer at least four times a day daily feedings, which is a slurry. So it's equal parts development food, so puppy or kitten food and water are mixed together. You can also use formula and wet food. So watered down formula and wet food, like puppy kitten formula, and of course mix that together. It should look like oatmeal. Cats, we often mix milk replacer with puppy, or sorry, with kitten food for cats. And you can complete this over a couple of weeks. So just gradually reducing the amount of water and milk with the food so that eventually it becomes just a wet food and then you can switch them to dry or you, you start with a little bit of dry available that's uh, moistened down with water or milk. It's very messy. This whole procedure of weaning is very messy and if you've ever had kittens and puppies in your house you know this very well that they walk through the slurry they poop in the slurry, they flip over dishes, they run away with dishes. It's crazy messy. <laughs> so good luck to you. Puppy and kitten solid food, typically up to six to eight months. I did change this. I find the recommendations change all the time, or at least it's hard to find a solid answer on this. So it is dependent on the size of the animal, if it's a really giant breed, if it's a large breed, if it's a toy breed, if it's a kitten. So general recommendations, six to eight months on the puppy or kitten solid formula, so the puppy or kitten food. Large breed, definitely choose a large breed formula for puppy food. Don't skimp out and just give a basic regular puppy food. The challenge with large breed dogs is their Ability to process calcium is definitely more sensitive than regular sized dogs and of course kittens. So essentially we worry a lot about the ratio of calcium as well as phosphorus in their diets. If they have too much calcium, it can cause challenges in their bone development. And likewise, if they don't have enough calcium, it can cause major issues with their very large long bone development as well. Overall, the calcium issue can affect them to cause these um, 
developmental diseases in their bone. And then people always ask when the full height or when they're done growing is, so exactly when that is specifically. And again, that's kind of a debatable question. General guidelines, small dogs and cats, 8 to 12 months, they'll typically be at their full size. They do tend to get a little bit more muscle as they get older, but you have to watch out because there's potential that they could get more fat as well. Medium and large dogs, about 12 to 18 months. And then giant breeds, some people suggest that they don't stop growing until they're about 24 months old. So it's quite a long time in their life, considering some giant breeds have a lifespan of about 8 years old. That's, they're growing for the majority of their life, which is quite unusual for dogs and cats. So puppy and kitten diet requirements, we have to look at protein, calcium, and overall energy requirements. If we're feeding too rich of a food in energy and nutrients, we can cause malformations in the bones and joints, and that's like growing too fast, which is not ideal. So again, looking at that balance is key. Calcium and energy, so if we have too much calcium and too much energy, then we're going to get into joint concerns. We can get into some of those puppy conditions, endochondral ossification versus osteochondritis, desiccans. Both of those, so essentially, uh, osteo, osteochondritis desiccans is the natural process of cartilage being replaced by bone. It's interrupted and cartilage is maintained instead of bone. So as puppies and kittens get older, they lose those growth plates between their bones, which are layers of cartilage. They're supposed to become bone as they get older. So the, the distal and proximal ends of their long bones all have cartilage on them, which is quite substantial as puppies and kittens. So in os OCD, in ost osteochondritis desiccans, they maintain that cartilage layer instead of getting bone, which makes them overall weaker and of course at higher risk of the slippage and just malformation of the actual joints. So these are conditions that are growth conditions and especially in large and giant breed dogs, these are the growth conditions that we have to be very, very cautious of. We don't want to cause them and we can do so generally by choosing a high quality puppy or kitten food. So we have higher levels of quality protein, but not pure, pure, pure protein in the diet. We have decreased energy in fat and carbohydrates. Slow changes are really important from food types, remembering that they have very young, very immature guts. They can't handle fast changes very well. They don't have the bacteria to do so. Meal feed four times daily until three to four months of age, then up to three times daily at six months, two times daily for the rest of life is ideal. And of course, ensuring that they are nice and healthy. Don't forget to run a fecal sample, so a sample of their poop, at some point while they're in their first year, ideally their first six months, because many dogs and cats are born with roundworms and with various parasites that will deplete their natural ability to process food in their guts because their bacteria in their guts is getting altered. They can get ulcerated intestines from worms. So things like that, really, really important to check for and treat if they have them. And then we have lactating and gestation. So gestation, of course, is pregnancy and lactating is pr production of milk. In these animals, we need to have highly digestible nutrients. They should be energy-dense diets. Many, many small meals, especially in an animal that is gestating. So an animal that has many, many, many puppies or kittens in their uterus, you can imagine how much room those puppies and kittens are taking up in that dog or cat's body. And they actually physically can't eat a lot of food at one time because their stomachs are pushed so far up because those puppies or kittens are pushing up against their diaphragm. So we have to remember this, that they may look disinterested in food, but it's, if they eat a few kibbles, that might be all they can fit into their poor, squished up stomachs at that time. So I just want to offer lots of small meals throughout the day for these, these pooches and kittens, or female cats. Increase the food intake to two to three times maintenance, and reduce intake after the fourth week. Queens and dams to 
sorry, weigh about 5 to 10% above normal body weight. So that's a good way to measure if you're pregnant, uh, dog or cat is getting too big. And of course, always, always, always remember fresh water for these guys. So when an animal is pregnant, they have decreased gastric motility. So again, keeping that in mind, they might not be hungry much. And then as things slowly sludge along in their intestines, they become more hungry. So those small meals frequently can help them in acquiring the nutrients that they need. And then we get into my favorite, geriatrics. I love old dogs and old cats. Cats, we typically consider them geriatric at about 10 years of age or greater. Small, medium dogs, same thing. Large breed, about nine years. And then, of course, giant breeds, greater than six years old, which is so hard when you have a six-year-old dog and they're suddenly a senior. Been there, and it's hard. Energy requirements definitely change for these old toots. They have a decreased RER. Protein has to be high in biological index to reduce the stress on the kidneys. So essentially, it has to be very bioavailable, and it has to be the protein that they actually need, so the amino acids that they actually need in their body. We can't give them heaps and heaps of protein that's unnecessary because it's going to be harder on their kidneys to process, and kidneys in older animals already are challenged. Kidneys typically are strained as animals get older, so we need to be very gentle on kidneys in geriatric animals. Caution with high-density food. We want everything to be very bioavailable so that it's easily digested. And regular weigh-ins and muscle condition scoring are really important. Because their metabolism has slowed down, we want to make sure that our old animals are not gaining weight and that they're also not losing weight too quickly either. So omega-3 in high amounts and omega-6 in small amounts are really beneficial to reduce inflammation in their joints and everywhere on their body. And of course, phosphorus and salt restrictions, we want to make sure that we're not overdoing the kidneys. If they're not eating, what are some common reasons that a geriatric animal might not eat? There are lots of reasons, so it's really important to monitor them closely. It could be something... Uh, such as dental disease, but of course it could also be kidney disease, it could be liver disease. There's all sorts of reasons that they might not eat. So we have to be very cautious. We want to really make sure that we're monitoring them closely as they get older. Look at this cute little old cat face. Look at it. Look at this little cute old cat face. So I love old cats because they get sunken eyes. They always look a little bit angry. They start to lose their musculature on their head, which they just look even more angry. It's almost like they have eyebrows. And then they get this little dark mouth that kind of hangs open just a little bit. I love old cats so much. So that this is just perfect. Perfect cat. So things to consider with geriatric animals, of course, where's the food bowl and water bowl? Is it accessible? This cat, I guarantee this cat has arthritis. Look at her. Look at this sassy old cat. So cats with arthritis are more likely to have a bowel movement or urinate outside the litter box. They're more likely to avoid going all the way down two flights of stairs to go access their food. Things like that have to be looked at. They have to be considered. It's a change that I've had to make recently with my geriatric cat that you can probably hear snoring in the background. But she decides to make her own litter box when I don't put the litter box on the floor that she resides on. So we have to think about these things. And of course, how is their bed looking these days? Do they have a nice, soft, comfortable place to lay or are they expected to lay on the hard ground? So those are just some considerations with geriatrics. And that is all for today. We can never go back.